and one other note before we get things really truly kicked off, um, please feel free to use the chat while we are talking and, and going through the panel. And there's also, you'll see at the very top, a Q&A tab, and you can click on the Q&A. And uh, if you do have questions for the panelists, we will be setting aside some time at the very end to go through your questions. And so you can upvote others' questions, you can chat them in the chat box, feel free to let us know when you do have questions. So with that, I am going to invite Zoe in. So, all right. Zoe, all you have to do is take your camera and your mic on and you'll be joining me in here. Perfect, wonderful. <laughs> Welcome. Hi, thank you. I love the hair. <laughs> I am honoring the late Carrie Fisher. So this is my May the 4th be with you look. Thank you everyone for your support. Took me a few tries, but um, hopefully they stay together for the duration of <laughs> the talk. Uh, so Zoe, do you wanna kick us off with um, explaining who you are, what you do at Yeswear, and anything else you might wanna share before we get things started? Yeah, thanks Felicia. Um, so I'm Zoe. I run the People Ops team here at Yesware. We are thrilled to be sponsoring this event with She Geeks Out. Um, Yesware has been partners with She Geeks Out for a number of years, um, but I haven't always been in this particular role at the company. So it's been really fun for me now getting to work with She Geeks Out in a whole new way, kind of on the corporate sponsorship side and really collaborating with Felicia and Rachel and the work that they do. I like to think of myself as a She Geeks Out triple threat because I am on the corporate sponsor side. I am an avid stan of events and attend as many as I can. And also I work with them on the ambassador side, which is kind of like their volunteer peer group. So um, huge fan and um, like I said, Yesword has been partnering with them for a number of years as part of the tech community in Boston. We're a small SaaS company out of Boston, Mass. Um, our product is a sales enablement tool. So um, we provide data and tools that help sales professionals improve their outcomes. Um, so things like helping reps spend time where it matters, um, making data-driven decisions, and crafting better content to engage with their customers. So um, we've been a big uh, part of the Boston tech scene. Um, that's kind of where we met She Geeks out and um, although we're bummed that we can't have people over at the office this time around hopefully we'll get to see everybody in person in the future and in the meantime it's cool to be able to do these virtual events um, and be able to connect with more people in more locations so just a huge thank you to the she geeks out team for putting this together and everybody for dialing in from their various uh, geo locations Wonderful, thank you, Zoe. Uh, I'm gonna invite up next, Jung. And so Jung, once I give you the power, which I have just done so, all I have to do is turn <laughs> off in your mic on and you'll be able to join us on stage. Wonderful. Jung, could you quickly um, let everyone share a little bit about your who you are, a brief introduction? Sure, thank you, Felicia, and thank you, Zoe. It's such a pleasure to be with everyone. My name is Jung Starrett. I'm a co-founder and principal of educational, professional education firm called Soul Co. And what we do is that uh, we co-create learning communities of wise and compassionate leaders for the well-being of all. And we do that by um, teaching and training uh, emotional intelligence skills. Wonderful, thank you. And then I'm going to, in a moment, just invite up our last speaker, Elaine. So Elaine, you now also have the power. So turn your camera on and your mic on and you'll join us. on. Stage. You need a little lightsaber like sound effect. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I just know. I just like, <laughs> don't know what lightsabers. <laughs> Whatever, may the fourth be with us. <laughs> um, Thank you for joining us, Elaine. Could you also give a brief introduction about who you are, anything else you want to share before we get into it? Sure. So, um, Thanks so much for inviting me. This is a pleasure to be part of this team. Um, I, I'm Elaine Pappas. I've been in people ops for almost 40 years. I have an undergrad and graduate degree in psychology um, and have always found that to be useful as part of the people ops um, organization. And um, it's just a pleasure to be part of this group. I've worked most recently, I, I, I retired in 2017, but I started to do some consulting. I, I worked recently with Zoe, who is a dear friend of mine. 
and mm-hmm. um, we we did a project and hired a bunch of good people over at Guessware, and I continued to work for some other people and do mostly recruiting at this time. Thank you all so much. So what I'd love to do is to actually start, and I'm going to say I'm inspired to start us off in this way by Zhang. So we did a a speaker call last week where we were going over the structure and, and questions and content, and um, and Zhang suggested we we do this activity together. And I really thought it was uh, very relevant and a really nice thing to do, especially given the crazy times that we are living in. So I'd love us to start by taking a deep breath together. And it's okay that we're all virtual and that I know all the participants are on mute. So let's just take a few moments and take a deep breath in. So. Hmm. Thank you. So why are we starting this way? Well, I'm repeating this practice that Zhang shared with us because it directly ties back to the topic at hand that we're speaking on today, emotional intelligence. Most of us, and I will say most of us, that's my assumption, but my assumption is most of us probably don't think that much about our breathing during the day. We tend to just take sort of short, shallow breaths which doesn't really give us the full amount of oxygen that we have available to us. And that can lead to poor concentration, mood swings, and even a decrease in our own ability to self-manage. And so when we're meditating, and for those of you who are more um, used to meditation and yoga, that sort of practice, when we take more intentional breaths, when we're more um, in tune with that, we are able to be more mindful and we can move away from just purely reacting. So I'd like to start us off with a question for each of the speakers in turn. And so I'd like you to each define, how do you define emotional intelligence? And what does emotional intelligence mean to you? So maybe we can actually start off with Elaine. Sure. Um, You know, I I guess the simplest way for me to define it is self-awareness and the ability to understand, you know, who you are, and how you have an impact on other people. And um, that includes to be a very good listener and um, have the ability to be empathetic. Um, but I, mostly uh, my one, my two words, I guess, would be self-aware. And actually, can we then move to Jung next? Could you share your definition and what emotional intelligence means to you? Yes, I agree with Elaine. Everything Elaine says, self-awareness is such a fundamental uh, building block of emotional intelligence. Um, so emotional intelligence to me means relating to myself and relating to others. So it's really about managing and building that relationship. So th- there is a my self component and the other. So I think it's really um, critical life skill. Great. And last but not least, Zoe. Yeah, I think about emotional intelligence as the ability to understand, anticipate, and adapt to my own and others' uh, emotions and experiences. Um, So if you think about IQ as um, book smarts, you can think about EQ as kind of social smarts or people smarts, and that's an easy way to think about it. There's also a kind of more academic model that talks about like different elements of um, of emotional intelligence that helps if you're kind of a beginner. So we've already touched on some of them, um, namely self-awareness, self-regulation, empathy, motivation, and social skills. Um, and so it is kind of on the one hand simple to talk about EQ, but on the other hand, there's lots of different elements. And as Jung said, it's both about sort of how you understand yourself as well as others. Mm-hmm. Great, thank you. And um, just I know this that you mentioned EQ, and we talk a lot about EQ, IQ, and probably for some of us on the call, IQ might be more um, more familiar to us. In my own experience, and feel free to jump in if you've seen other things from the panel. But in my own experience, I've seen that emotional intelligence or EI and emotional quotient, which is EQ, are tend to be used pretty interchangeably. But um, really when we're talking about EQ, it's, it's measuring that level of our emotional intelligence. And it's a great way to sort of think about that in, in conjunction with IQ, because that's something mm-hmm. we don't tend to really talk about as much necessarily. Um, is that true for, for the panel? And when you're, you're talking about these terms that you tend to use them pretty interchangeably? 
I do. I also use the term soft skills, depending on what the context is of the conversation. If we're talking more about um, recruiting or resumes or things like that, we talk about soft skills as kind of people skills, communication, things like that, as opposed to more of the technical skills. Um, you can also sort of describe it as like multiple intelligences and sort of the different ways that that shows up, um, whether that's um, there's like relational intelligence and social intelligence, things like that. So all interchangeable overlapping for me. Great. And you just mentioned technical skills. And actually, I'd like to start off with you, John, for this next question. So in your opinion, why why the importance of EQ or EI and why shouldn't we just focus on technical skills? Yeah, no, that's a, I, I love that question. And I, I laughed because my um, former career as a corporate lawyer for 20 years uh, in high tech corporations like IBM and Microsoft, I've worked with a lot of highly technically skilled leaders uh, in the organizations. And it's really interesting to see how they were really, really smart, they high IQ and and also companies like you know Microsoft, IBM, a lot of resources, yet when they could not really harness their full potential or their team's potential, something else was lacking there. And at the same time, in my own career, the higher I went up the chain and more successful I looked from outside, I felt more and more hollow inside. And I felt this disconnect between outside and inside, how I showed up. So successful outside, but inside I was just like, what is going on? I'm always not enough. I always feel this lack of like, what is going on? Something is wrong with me. And that's how I used to think. And I try to use that, like my cognition to solve it. Because as a lawyer, same thing. I used to love working with engineers because the logical mind works just like the lawyer's mind. So I, I used to love working with engineering clients. But the, what, what, what I found out is that the technical skills, and we just go to the head, but most of the times we're cut off from neck down. So we don't harness the sort of the emotions as well as our bodily sensations that's really informing us like what we're really feeling. And there's so much intelligence and emotion. So when even like emotional intelligence, one way I wanna say is that emotions have a lot of intelligence, i.e. real time data. We need to harvest moment to moment to moment to relate to myself, what's going on inside and to others. So interesting thing about the technical skills is that here's a study that was done and what they distinguish, the distinguishing the star performers from the average performers in tech sectors, here are the six things. I don't know if the audience would be interested. Should I share it? Yeah, and I'll actually put this in the chat as well so they can read along while you share. Oh, thank you so much, Felicia. So the first thing is strong achievement drive and high achievement standards, right? We get that, like we, so number one. Number two, ability to influence. Number three, conceptual thinking. Number four, analytical ability. Number five, initiative in taking on challenges. Initiatives on taking on challenges. Number six, self-confidence. So out of these top six skills, only two are the cognitive skills, which is number three and four, conceptual thinking and analytical. But all the other skills are emotional intelligence skills. So yes, technical skills are essential, right? Because like it's necessary and it may not be sufficient for us to really thrive um, in our career. Um, so that's why emotional intelligence plays into technical area just as well. Great, thank you. And I know that Zoe and Elaine, you both have a lot of experience in people ops and recruiting. So with that same question, why shouldn't we focus just on technical skills? Is that a question that you've come across in your experience? Any thoughts to add to what John just shared? So if you don't mind, I, I guess I'll go first and I'll be brief, but uh, you know, um, a couple things. One is that I love recruiting, um, but as I said, I've been doing people ops for a long time. So I've been doing what I call front end, back end, end to end, you know, whatever you want to uh, look at it. Um, and, and when I've had the end to end responsibilities, um, there's nothing worse than hiring a truly excellent technical person who can't get along with the team. 
because that presents a real challenge. I mean, we we love the intelligence, we love the the you know obviously all the brain power that they bring, but if if they're intimidating or or harming other people, um, that has to be dealt with and. Um, you know, uh, over time you learn how to kind of screen for that, make sure that, that you, you don't invite those people in, but sometimes you do, and then you have to deal with it. And it's just, you know, technical is important. EQ is important. Zoe, I'll turn it over to you. No, I totally agree. I mean, especially in a smaller company where it's particularly collaborative, there's no one person who doesn't interact with people from other groups on a daily basis. Um, and so it's really important for us that people work well with others and um, they have some level of self-awareness and they can kind of adapt to different environments. So um, absolutely, it's something that we look for. Um, Elaine and I have looked for it together in the hiring process. Maybe we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, but it particularly shows itself when like Elaine was saying, you have somebody that maybe doesn't have that and is at your company or in a group, um, it's pretty toxic. So um, the more you can kind of look for it up front, the better. Um, but it's also the kind of thing that you don't necessarily get to know about someone uh, unless you really get to know them and talk to them. It's not just something you can screen for on a resume, kind of in a black and white setting. Uh, emotional intelligence, like we said, is complex and nuanced, and it requires you actually getting to know someone authentically, and that takes time. Great, thank you. And I'm actually going to skip ahead a little bit because you mentioned, um, you know, the hiring process and how to think about it and assess it. And so before we get into the hiring process and how this may or may not be looked at during that whole procedure, I'd love to hear from you each, um, you know, how, like, can we actually measure or assess for emotional intelligence or EQ? Like, are there ways to figure out how much we have or what that looks like within each of us? Any thoughts on that? Maybe we can start with you, Zoe, and then I'll, I'll go back to each of the other panels. Sure. I mean, there are probably tools, platforms, tests that claim to or, or maybe do in, in some regard. Um, I mean, there's certainly an IQ test, right, um, that can spit out a number. Um, but in my opinion, it's just, again, it's like so nuanced and squishy that um, at least in my role, I care a little bit less about like knowing what somebody's rating or score is on, on any level um, and more about sort of the holistic picture um, and, and how that applies to the context of my particular company. So maybe one thing is more important than another, um, depending on what role it is. Um, but I would say it's more about like the holistic view than any one particular measure, at least in my opinion. Okay, great. And then John, can we go to you next maybe for your thoughts on that? Sure. No, I agree with everything as always said. It's really hard to detect these things. And uh, one thing about the quotient, like, you know, IQ quotient and emotional intelligence quotient, and I usually tend to focus on the intelligence because it's really a skill that can be developed. So when people think about it, it's like, oh, is it like IQ? And they think they're like, oh, well, is this, is this like, is this all I got? Mm -hmm. But in fact, it's an ability, the self-awareness, self-regulation, empathy, even motivation can be all learned skills. So one thing that I, um, and also emotional intelligence is not for the just sake of like, oh, I have a high you know, EQ, but how does this show up on the ground? How does this show up in interrelating with your team members, you, with your you know, manager and with people you manage? So things like, do you take pause before you have a difficult conversation, right? Or do you take the time to really understand other people's perspectives and their experiences if you make a decision as a manager. So we look at the signs of the behavior, like what do they do? And then we can help them increase it. We can help them up their game by teaching them different skill sets to, okay, it's okay to take a pause, right? Before just launching on to something. It's also taking the time, listen more, uh, both Zoe and Elaine mentioned the listening skills, like listening more and then not with your agenda, but just really listen. And what, what does that look like? We can teach people to listen. So these are all the skills that can, that can be um, improved. Great. And any other thoughts to add, Elaine? Yeah. yeah you know, Felicia, what I, I'd say is that um, 
again, I've been very blessed in my career um, and have worked with some extremely um, extraordinary people. Um, in the tech world, I, we, we go through what I always call a highly engaged interview process. So it's not like one and done. We expect you to interact with us on several different occasions. So we'd have different touch points and we get to know you. And um, I, care, I care very deeply about how somebody behaves um, with the scheduler of the interviews um, and, mm -hmm. and how, uh, you know, how they communicate. I care very deeply about when somebody comes in for an in-person interview and how kind or not they are to the person who is greeting them and, and setting them up in the room. Um, I, I care very deeply about whether or not as we go in and out throughout the day, just make sure that you have water and you have whatever you need to eat. If somebody is going to actually pick up their glass and take it with me back to the kitchen, or if they're just going to leave it there, expecting somebody else to pick it up, we we've screened we've used those touch points to screen people, and I will tell you that um, the people who have higher EQ are more inclined to be thoughtful <laughs> and 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 positive um, throughout that process, and and you know treating everyone pretty equally and, and having that awareness to be, uh, not to be elite or to be, um, you know, thinking that there's any kind of hierarchy because I've also worked in very flat organizations where hierarchy is not gonna fly. <laughs> Thank you for that perspective. And actually I'm gonna go back to you, Jung, because um, you mentioned sort of the difference between EQ, which is more fluid and you can grow it versus IQ, which is more fixed. And so how can somebody work on developing or growing their EQ or their EI if they want to focus on that skill set? Yeah, no, it is, it's, it's a wonderful question. Yes, it's a skill that can be growing. And as um, Elaine started us off with self-awareness, I think that's really the building block. And self-awareness means that a lot of people say like, oh, I took the Myers-Briggs test and I know this is like, you know, I am INTJ and, you know, all these things too, like I'm red, I'm, I'm green or I'm blue. There are a lot of things that test that can you know tell you, and that's great, that's wonderful. Like, what is my personality? But the self awareness that we're talking about is the really being able to relate to yourself internally, like your internal resources. What are you thinking? What are you feeling? And you know, how, even physiologically. So we have three dimensions of body, emotions, and mental. Are we coherent? Are we together? And this is actually what mindfulness does. And a lot of times, you know, we see mindfulness in media and people just like zoning out and like piecing out. I'm not thinking anything, an empty mind. That's actually not real mindfulness. Mindfulness is noticing. And that's where the awareness skills come up, right? Noticing what's happening moment to moment to moment with kindness and curiosity. So it's internally what's happening as well as around because this is emotional intelligence is not just self but others. So what's happening inside me, what's happening around me. So really the attention training and awareness training, and that's where everything you know really starts. And then from there, self-awareness. And once you know how you're feeling, how do you manage your emotions? Sometimes it's difficult. Anger comes up, fear comes up, anxiety comes up. How do I manage that? And from there to also the motivation part, like what is really important to me so that I align my action and my values together. So I'm walking the talk. So that really builds trust in the, in the, in the team, right? No matter what level you are. Mm -hmm. And from there to empathy. So if I am self-aware, so science tells us that actually the self-awareness capability, interestingly enough, grows the empathy. When I'm aware of my own internal process, that also with a mirror neuron and all other, um, our neurological wiring helps us to understand another better. So I would say start with self-awareness and mindfulness. Wonderful. Um, any other thoughts to add to that from Elaine or you, Zoe? I, I totally agree. That's the best place to start. The only other thing I would add is um, surrounding yourself with as a diverse community as possible, really getting to know lots and lots of different kinds of people um, kind of just adds to your, your toolkit and your experience level and breadth. I mean, that's one of 
the reasons why recruiting is so challenging, but also really fun is because you're talking to all different kinds of personalities and backgrounds and um, technical folks and salespeople and, and all of the above. Um, and I think that that is what has helped me kind of flex my EI muscle is, is just talking to such a wide range of people. Um, so I would say that that makes a big difference. Wonderful. And, and I'll add, really Felicia, if, if you don't mind, I'm just going to add two um, hopefully humorous things. Um, <laughs> we all well, love adding humorous things in. <laughs> this, the, the, I learned this literally back in the early 90s. And um, I worked with a woman who was in a position of, of, of power. Um, she was a regional manager and she, uh, she had a lot of people reporting to her. And she always sounded mean. I mean, she was like a terrifying person. And uh, um, we were getting complaints because she was just doing her business, but she just sounded so mean. So uh, like, I, I literally brought this little compact to, in, hoping that I'd be able to give an example. We taught her that when she, that most of our business was on the phone, that when she was on the phone, she had to look in a mirror <laughs> and smile and smile because the smile needed to come through in her voice yeah. because she, 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 it wasn't natural, but it made her much more effective. Um, I'll, I'll say. And then the second thing, again, just to make you guys laugh, um, I had never heard of this until recently. Has anyone ever heard of RFB? Uh, yes, RBF. <laughs> RB, resting bitch face. <laughs> like, no, no, I, don't, I, I don't even swear. But, um, but the funny thing is, like, some people just have like a naturally angry looking face. <laughs> and it's, you know, people will actually talk about it saying like, it's not like, I don't mean to, it's just the way I look. But if um, when we talk about EQ or EI or, or whatever, I always when I talk to my friends and when we're talking from a mentorship perspective, it's kind of like just put a smile on your face if you can. Um, it will make a difference, uh, you know, whether you're on the phone or whether you're in person, because um, you know it's probably inside you. It's just not showing, <laughs> and I recommend that it show. <laughs> We're, we're seeing a little bit in the chat where someone suggested aiming for RNF, which is resting neutral face. Mm, I like that. <laughs> um, I, I definitely feel like I'm a, a fellow RBFer over here, so I appreciate that. <laughs> Not at all. I'd like to go back to talking a little bit about the hiring and recruiting process with this overlay of emotional intelligence. And so maybe we can start with Zoe and Elaine to kick us off on this part. But um, Elaine, you mentioned a little bit earlier that you look at sort of cues on how candidates are holding themselves, what they're doing to start to assess for that EQ. Are there other things that may be more formal or other ways of trying to look at this idea of EI or EQ in the recruiting process? If so, what could those be? Um, or is there even any conversation about assessing for EQ as part of that, that candidate's process? Yes, I, I mean, um, I'll start first and then so we can go. I, I, I do virtually, uh, either a 30 or a 45 minute phone screen with every candidate before they come in or before they talk to a hiring manager. And um, particularly for technical recruiting, I always like to ask about team structure. What I want to hear is what is your gestalt of the, you know, who's on your team? How do you interact with them? Um, how do you describe team members? Because that's a, I, a, I want to know the size of your team compared to the team I'm going to hire you into. But I, I also want to know how you relate to that team. And um, I, I, I get that literally in third, usually in 30 to 60 seconds. Mm -hmm. well, that That's short of a time, huh? Yeah, easily. And then you should yeah. a pro. <laughs> it takes me at least two, two to three minutes. <laughs> Um, anything to add? Um, other ways that I look for signs uh, in the hiring process, um, definitely looking for active listening skills and how candidates are asking questions um, in the interview. And for example, are they asking any at all? Um, and then 
you know, are they asking kind of like pre-planned um, questions that maybe are not <laughs> relevant to the conversation that we had? Or are they actually like picking up on things that we talked about and playing off of each other? Those, you know, that's conversational. And um, are they following up to things that I said um, that shows that they're a paying attention and be like kind of picking up on that next level of, of conversation. So that sort of question asking is really important to me. Um, the other thing that we sometimes do in interviews to gauge for this is either doing this live or, or asking about a time when, when they have received feedback on something and how they respond to uh, receiving feedback um, and sort of both their um, initial reaction and also kind of how they apply it and are they able to step into a little bit of a vulnerable state? Are they self-aware enough to know sort of um, their strengths and weaknesses and, and how to uh, adjust? So those are some exercises that we do on the recruiting side to sort of gauge for that because again, like I said, um, I think it takes a while to really get to know people. Interviews are interviews and so, you know, uh, people are a little bit um, prepared and and so you might not always get the authentic response but some of those more like uh live activities can be helpful mm -hmm. great we're actually seeing some interesting comments come through in the chat and so some people are sort of sharing about how um in sort of the age of corona because we have to sort of acknowledge it right <laughs> that when you're wearing a mask it can be hard to tell if someone's smiling or <laughs> And I think it's really interesting because, you know, for pretty much, I would say probably almost not quite everyone, but for a lot of people who are currently going through that job process, that recruiting process right now, it's probably going to be virtual. And there may still be able to be video, of course, like we all are sharing right now, but it might be over the phone or there might be other ways that people are engaging with each other. And so I'm curious uh, for all of you, your thoughts on if you are a job seeker, especially a job seeker right now, how could you highlight or um, sort of showcase your emotional intelligence or what considerations might there be given that we are in this this time where we're not really having those one-on-one -on -one physical interactions, where we're not taking the cup back to the kitchen? Um, would love your thoughts on that. Maybe we can start with you, Jung, and then go back to you and um, Zoe and Elaine. Yeah, uh, what comes up uh me, as I'm listening to um, Zoe and Elaine, um, there's a lot of expertise there too. And what I, it's so funny with a lot of your expertise that you can tell in 60 seconds or less. And I think also when we think about our human body, this is an amazing biocomputer, whether we actually realize it or not. And we can really attune to people. So when, as a hiring manager, when we listen, that we can pick up incongruencies. And also like our like mind like relates to mind and emotions relates to emotion and body relates to body. Even when we are on this like virtual space, I think we can feel each other. Like I can feel one another and I can feel you feeling me. So how comfortable the person is in their own skin. And I think one sign of emotional intelligence is humility. Mm -hmm. And the confidence that comes from being comfortable in one's own skin because of that self, we're coming back to self-awareness again. Knowing my strength as well as weaknesses and with honesty, right? Because then if you're honest, then you can be coached, you can learn all these skills. And I'd love to hear from Zoe too. Like we wanna, you know, bring in people with that smarts, but also willing to learn. So in these conversations, and one, one of the things that when I used to hire uh, people in my teams is a question like when you made a mistake, how did you deal with it in the last six months or a year? You know, what was the biggest mistake you made and how did you deal with it? And the often people have like amazing achievement, accomplishment, resume, they show up. But when you ask them, how do they respond to that? So you may want to do some self-reflection. I think job searches, a lot of it is that like what I want, but also flipping it and then do a U-turn and say, what can I contribute? 
And what is like doing a research on the company is like, what is this company about? Can I align with their value? And how, what can I come to contribute to? And it's as much as assessing the company as well. Is this an EQ high company where I can really thrive as well as, right? So this like, how can I be honest with myself? How can I um, appear as who I am? And then willingness to learn and grow. Mm-hmm. That's what I would suggest. Thank you. Can we go to you next, Zoe? Sure. I think that was great. Um, other things I would add, you know, including relational skills and experience on your resume is really important in addition to the technical skills. So we talked about, you know, it's not just that technical skills matter, the, the sort of people and collaboration and communication skills are equally as important for us these days. So um, you know, a lot of people have kind of summaries or objective statements. Um, and these things can be maybe a little bit harder to measure or put in bullet points. And so that's a great opportunity to do so in sort of a description, um, you know, talking about how you enjoy working in a team atmosphere or how you were voted into a leadership position by your peers, things like that. Um, It's a little bit more of a like show, don't tell uh, kind of a thing. So um, descriptive, Um, things in your resume, same with cover letters. Um, Jung mentioned doing research on the company. That's a great way to show. That's like the easiest possible way to show emotional intelligence in the hiring process is actually including a cover letter and showing that, you know, you put a little bit of preparation, you actually care and you're um, showing interest to to the company and and maybe mentioning things like their values or um, anything that they seem to express as important to them as a company. Um, You know, people like talking about themselves and the same goes with like businesses and companies. And so, you know, I I love when I see people have done the research and know what our product does or know what our company values are. Um, So those are some some really simple ways to do so. And then you talked about kind of being virtual in this, you know, interview process. You can still hold confident body language on um, video calls. You know, it is a little bit more challenging than in person, but there are still things that you can do um, to show attentiveness. Um, you know, we're all like nodding at each other. That is <laughs> helpful. Um, you know, the tone and pace of your voice, the language that you use, those are all really simple body language techniques that you can still use virtually. Mm-hmm. And Elaine, last but not least. I, I think what I would add, Felicia, um, you know, in, in addition to what Young and um, Zoe have said, because that's really, everything's really relevant, just in the COVID-19 world, I have found that I'm I'm a very cut and dry interviewer. I mean, I'm, I'm very friendly and very nice, whatever, but um, I, I pretty much have my process and I want to run my process. What I've learned is, um, I can't do a 30 minute interview because I need to spend the thir- first five to seven minutes talking about how are you doing? Yeah. Um, how, how has this affected you and your family? Because I think it's almost cruel to ignore that. I mean, that just seems weird to me. Um, we're all going through so many things that, you know, and if people are saying, you know, I'm very blessed, I'm very happy, I'm very lucky, that's great. But I've also talked to people who've lost people. Yeah. And I just want to, you know, actually, as a human to human, have that conversation. Um, the second thing, I just wanted to support something that Zoe said, um, and just to maybe embarrass her. <laughs> no. uh, you know how a lot of people do like a, a semester abroad and, and they go to Italy and they look to look at all the museums and everything. Well, Zoe was like spending time in Africa helping um, children who, <laughs> who were disadvantaged. And uh, it was on her resume. And quite frankly, it, sh- it, it really helped. Um, it stood out and it shined for me. And I just thought that that was really, you know, uh, 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 good evidence of somebody who had high EQ. Thank you, Elaine. You like hired me in a previous life. So that's why. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. And, and thank you, Elaine, for the, those comments too, because I think that's so true. You just hit the nail on the head is, you know, I'm noticing this too. I'm sure everyone on the call has also felt this where you can't just jump right in, even email. Yeah. I know there's a lot of jokes out there that are going around as to 
um, sort of emails in the time of COVID. And it starts off by saying, you know, I hope, I hope you and your family are doing well. I, you know, in these terrible times, and it's just, you have to, it's a little cheesy. It might be over the top, but like, as you said, you don't know what people are going through and we have to acknowledge um, the humanity in each other even before we get into the, the cut and dry of the business. So I thank you for, for bringing that up too. Um, I'm actually going to switch gears and I'm going to turn it over to the participants for their Q&A. And so we've got a bunch of questions that have been coming through and there's been some upvoting as well. So if you haven't had a chance already, feel free to throw a question in here. We'll go through as many as we can. And if we don't get through all of the Q&As from you, then we will share them out afterwards. But if you um, want to also scroll through and see there's a question in there that you were going to ask, but is already in there, you can upload it as well. I'm going to start with the ones that have the most votes and then go down the list. So the top rated question is, how do you convey emotional intelligence as a skill set in a resume? I think we already hit on some of that, but if there's anything else that you'd like to add, I'll just open it up to the floor, anyone who wants to jump in. You're like, nope, gave you all my knowledge. <laughs> no, 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 it's tough, right? It's tough. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and actually, maybe if there are other thoughts that people have that um, that were not covered, um, feel free to throw those in the chat too. But I'm going to move to the next question, which is. But but, but I will say one thing: <laughs> any, anything that shows leadership yeah. or anything that you do in terms of volunteering, I mean, we all have busy lives, and 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 there's, you know lots of things that are, are are you know coming at us to try and, and take up all of our time but but if you are a person who has uh, some emotional intelligence who also does some volunteering or does some you know mentoring or whatever you can always put that on a resume that's mm -hmm. that's that's a definite skill mm -hmm. yeah absolutely you know we look for well-rounded humans it's not all about um the domain experience that you have, especially for you know our younger candidates who maybe are just getting started anyway. So um, the more you can share kind of your interests, hobbies, experiences outside of just a day-to-day -day job is helpful. Um, I, and I know I mentioned it before, but you know I really do look for uh, collaboration experience and, and working across different teams. That's probably the number one thing for me, um, especially for more technical positions where they are really used to strictly highlighting, you know, programming languages that they know and computer software programs and, and whatnot. Um, but if I see that they've worked across product team and a design team and, and collaborated, that that's one signal to me. Um, so those are are some examples. And, and then, like I said, sort of anything you can use the sort of descriptive narrative um, opportunities in either a cover letter or a statement at the top of your resume is helpful. Great, thank you. Um, next question is, what are some ways that you can cultivate EQ or EI in your fellow teammates? Or it's not within you yourself, but in your team. Can you help on that? That's a great question. Um, the first thing that comes to mind for me um, is creating a culture of feedback um, amongst each other and being really like open and vulnerable. And um, that's hard to do and, and probably not possible in every culture, but um, that's a great way to kind of both gain self-awareness for yourself as you care about others' uh, experiences and perspectives of, of working with you, um, as well as creating almost like a, a group emotional intelligence of, of your team. You know, like units can have emotional intelligence, teams have dynamics. Um, and so you can kind of contribute to that, um, you know, by sharing what's working, what's not, being really open with each other, being vulnerable, like I said. So those are some of the things that come to mind for me. I guess the other thing that I'll add is if, um, you know, once in a while you find that you're working um, in an environment where your executive leadership might be lacking some of the um, EQ, EI skills, and uh, uh, the best thing you can do is to get an, an outside consultant to coach, an executive coach. Um, you, you know, if you're in a position to provide that kind of feedback to your executives, that's great. But it's even better to have, um, you know, a neutral outside party and, you know, 
Jim, I'm not sure if you want to talk about that at, at all, but I, I've done that before and it's really helpful because it can be taught. Absolutely. Uh, I completely agree with Elaine. We can't do this alone. I mean, emotional intelligence is like people skill, right? So like, it's not one person doing it, reading books about it or, you know, YouTube or taking courses because it really does require, um, um, yeah, the, the relational quality to it. So, and everybody can learn. And I think um, also going back to what um, Zoe said earlier about the diversity, I think in community and even workspace, I would, you know, go uh, have a, you know, cup of coffee or, I mean, we can't do it now, but whenever there is a, a opportunity connecting with folks who are doing completely different things from us. So we learn about their challenges. So I may not know, about finance or sales but this is what i do and just like hey you know but can we have a cup of coffee and just listen and learn i think there is a lot that can come um from yeah. that i just wanted to say one other thing on that flesh if that's okay um kind of the flip side of looking for these things in the hiring process is then holding each other accountable to those um when you're, you know, a growing team or existing employees. And, and so I mean, um, using performance reviews and like feedback cycles um, as an opportunity to give that feedback that I was mentioning kind of like more casually with each other. Um, but in performance reviews, having competencies or expectations of holding these people skills as equally as important to those technical skills. So you know, you can work with your HR teams or your management teams to make sure that those are things that are included in performance management. Like mm -hmm. how do people work with others and are they showing respect in meetings, things like that. So actually working it into um, like job expectations um, is kind of the flip side to that. Thank you for that. Um, so the next question, I think we may have already touched on, but I'll just share it again, just in case there's anything else that comes to mind. Um, if you have any other resources for increasing or working on your EQ, anything that you didn't quite mention? One thing, just uh, after Zoe mentioned, another thing that came up for me is that the Google did a study um, about what makes a team an effective team. And, you know, a lot of people thought that, like, is it their, you know, manager's background, people's personality, you know, manager's style. But it turns out that it's none of those things. It's not who's in the team, but how people work together. So actually, it's, a, it's more the norm and norm being unwritten rules, right? How people work together, it turns out to be the psychological safety. So how do you create the psychological safety in the team? So if you're a leader of a team, you can think about that. If you're a contributor, how do you play? How do you create the psychological safety within the team? So all the things that I've heard uh, from both um, Elena and Zoe, I think is really important in creating a safe environment. Feedback needs to be you know, given in a way that's respectful, like people are ready to hear it. And then how how to also um, make everyone accountable. And one thing that just came up for me is that when we create the group norm, sometimes like it's hard to know what they are. But if the groups can say, hey, here are the ground rules. Can we all adhere to it? Mm. So they can create their own, you know, rules, mm -hmm. the ground rules that they want to abide by. So it's a more of a collective, you know, co-created environment where everybody can, you know, participate. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, next question is, do you have any recommendations for maintaining a standard of self-awareness or EQ during periods of significant workload or rapid change? Mm -hmm. That's a tough one. <laughs> um, <laughs> maintaining a standard. I'm not sure this is quite answering the question, but um, making sure that you know you are practicing self-care and mindfulness during times of um, significant workload, stress, or rapid change um, is particularly important. It helps reset um, your alignment. So Jung talked about uh, body emotions and, and mind, right? Um, and that is is really the point of 
centering practices and mindfulness, I think um, that really helps so that you don't get so caught up in the stress of, of the task or kind of the existential stress that we're all uh, going through right now. So I would, I'd suggest mindfulness practices as probably the number one way to uphold that right now. Yeah. I would second that and, and I think also the times of change and challenges are the times when these skills are actually most necessary. So in other words, using the skills right. to get through the difficult time right, and yes. change. This is when it's at play. And so I love uh, this uh, practices. And then one thing I just want to quickly mention is the self-compassion. Mm. And when you say self-compassion, then acknowledging that, yeah, this is really hard. And sometimes we want other people to acknowledge it. But if, let's say, everybody's busy doing their thing, we can also give that gift to ourselves. Like, ah, it's really hard. And everybody is in this together. So this is part of being human and life is hard. And then what can I do right now? Like, what is self-care? Because the one question that I think I remember, like I still have uh, difficulty asking is that, what do I need right now? I'm always asking what other people need, but what do I need right now? Could be anything from a cup of green tea to walk outside or a call with a you know trusted friend or advisor or mentor, right? Any one of those. Yeah. I love that. I find that sometimes we're our own hardest critics and it can be really hard to take yeah. that step back and, and really practice that self-compassion. And I think especially in these in these crazy times, like you said, it, it, it is I think easier to to give it outwards than to give it inwards. And so having that reminder that it doesn't only have to be a one-way street is really helpful Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, all right, let's see. We have a question on how do you communicate EQ on a resume or in a cover letter? So I think we already talked about the resume, but um, I do want to just bring this question up for the cover letter aspect. Have you seen anything that helps communicate EQ well on a cover letter? Um, it might be similar to what we already talked about with the resume, but any other thoughts on that? I think we've already talked a little bit about it, um, maybe just kind of going deeper on some of those examples and really being able to own that narrative and story in it in a deeper way than you could in, in one sentence or a bullet on, um, on a resume. Um, some people share like personal values that they have um, and, and that really reflects a sense of self-awareness and self-reflection. Um, and intelligence about your own experience and what you can bring to the table. So I, I love seeing things about people's personal values and then thinking about, you know, how does that align to um, our culture here and um, can they bring something new to the table and, and things like that. So that's another way. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add, I'm not a big fan of cover letters, but I do think that they are very re uh, uh, revealing. And the one thing that you don't want to have in a cover letter is 17 eyes. <laughs> uh, I want this. I can do this. I will. I think I will benefit from working for your company because I will learn a lot from your company and <laughs> just minimize the number of eyes. <laughs> that's so true. I think it's cover letters. That's a whole other topic, right? We could probably have yeah. a three hour workshop just on how to craft a cover letter. It's at once, super simple, but very, very complex, as we know. For the um, record, I love cover letters, so. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, I think um, I will I will say there, it's definitely, it can be very revealing, as, as Elaine said, for sure. So we are just about coming up. We have a few minutes left, um, and I'm just taking a scroll through the last couple questions that we have. A few of them we've already answered. Um, I want to highlight one that I'm just looking at right now, which is how have you found EQ or EI to affect what you've worked on? So not necessarily the team, but the product itself. Has that come into play at all in any of your experiences? The product itself. Um, for me, it would be more so the team that I'm on. I mean, EI has really pushed me into people ops. Um, I know this isn't 
answering your question, but uh, I was previously in sales um, and just found that the pieces of sales that I were I didn't like um, or that I wasn't good at was because everything was sort of guiding me towards like the people in relationship building aspect of it. Um, and so like recruiting is a perfect example of like putting that role in a different setting in a different context. Um, so for me, less of the product and more so the team. If I can say something, I think it's really important thing in product development because empathy, the user experience is key to developing product. That's going to be love. I, you know, I used to work at Microsoft, but I always said that Apple knew what the consumers wanted, right? The Steve Jobs understanding empathy versus Microsoft, you know, products were a lot about engineers being very smart about it and they wanted to show how smart they were. So there was two like user experience was two very different things. So whenever we develop something, that user, the other's experience and perspective, I think taking that into account is very important. Yeah, I think I'll just build on that then. Um, at another company, I was given an opportunity to head up a, a creating the a philanthropic program. And that was right up my alley and I'm a baby boomer. And so generally speaking, that's the type of thing that I would just do and take and run with it. But I knew my company fairly well and I knew my people and I just said, gosh, this is a great, fantastic opportunity to get a whole bunch of people involved. And so if you can, you know, invite other people to team up with you to do good things, um, it's a better, usually it's a benefit to everyone and it, you create a better end product. Um, and also you get a whole lot of people who, um, you know, could be part of something that's that's bigger than any one person. So it's it's teamwork. It's you know inviting people to team up with you. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. We are we are just at time. So I want to say thank you to all of you uh, for sharing your wisdom and your thoughts. Um, it's been really really educational and wonderful. And uh, we're going to shut down the presentation part of it, but the the tables and the space will be open for about another hour or so. So if any of you want to stick around and just participate in networking, everything will be open still. Um, I'm not sure what the schedules are for each of the speakers, but um, if they have some time to hang around, please feel free to find them in the speakers lounge couch area. And of course, you can find me um, in the Ask SGO area. But appreciate all of you tuning in. And thank you again for sharing your wisdom, everybody. Thank, thank you, you very much. much. Excited. Thank you.